Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We had a series of wonderful presentations by brilliant speakers. Now, we are having another interesting talk on has time come to say bye bye to vitamin K antagonist in non valvular atrial fibrillation. And the speaker is none other than T.C. Manoria. I know him as a man who has collected more gold from universities as medals than he got in Dori. And not only that, he is a man who has been the past president, not only of Cardiological Society of India, but of API as well. He had been the past dean of ICP as well as ICME. He had been the vice vice president of SARS Cardiac Society. So we have such a brilliant person amongst us who is going to give us a talk and who comes from Bhopal, the heart of the country, heart of Madhya Pradesh. Without further delay, I will not stand between him and you. And I request Professor Mandaria to start the talk. So for the next uh, 15 minutes, I'll be talking on this interesting topic. Has time come to say bye-bye to VKs in non atrial fibrillation? All of us know we have uh, three NOACs, although they are more uh, adequately called as DOACs, but I will be using NOACs in my lecture because that is a more familiar terms. So we have three NOACs, Debigatron, Rivaroxaban, and Apexaban. Adoxaban is not available to us. And all of us know stroke in atrial fibrillation occurs because of a detachment of clot from the left atrium into the cerebral circulation. What is very important to realize is that stroke is a devastating complication of atrial fibrillation because of a panoply of reasons. Firstly, it produces large hemispheric infarcts with massive neurological deficit, which can kill the patient or leave him permanently disabled. The size of the clot is usually large. Hospitalization is often prolonged and recovery is poor. 30 day mortality, very high, 24%. One year mortality, 50%. And sudden hemorrhagic transformation can occur. And recurrence is common in absence of adequate treatment. But these strokes can be minimized by optimum oral anticoagulants. And all of us know we have the SPA program running globally to prevent these devastating strokes. So the first big message in this context is prevent and prevent stroke and atrial fibrillation rather than treating them because it is a devastating complication. Now, if we look at the history, we had VKAs approved for prevention of stroke and atrial fibrillation way back in 1954, and NOACs came from 2010 onward, Debegatron came first. So warfarin was the uncontested king for prevention of stroke for almost 56 years in atrial fibrillation, despite several limitations. So let's have a look on the limitations of the warfarin. The first major limitation of warfarin is it has a narrow therapeutic range. Patient on warfarin has to keep their INR between two to three, so they are always working on a tight rope, trying to balance the ischemic and the bleeding risk. Because we know if the INR goes below two, there is an increase in the strokes. If the INR goes above three, there's an increase in the intracranial bleeding. The second major limitation is because warfarin has a lot of drug-to-drug -drug interaction, drug-to-food interaction, as you can see on the slide. So it has unpredictable pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. The same dose in different individuals can produce different response. The same dose in the same individual over different period of time can produce different response. So patient on warfarin uh, requires frequent INR monitoring, dose adjustment, frequent visits to physicians, and TTR, all of us know, even the best of the trial, it may be 60 or 65%. And this interferes with the quality of life. And the other major problem with warfarin is that the INR keeps on fluctuating despite our best presence. And this is one of the important reasons for intracranial hemorrhage in patients on warfarin with atrial fibrillation. 
and it is a slow onset, a slow offset. There is teratogenicity, genetic polymorphism. So warfarin, although it reduces stroke by two thirds, has lots of limitations. And most of these limitations, as you can see, have been circumvented by the NOACs. They have predictable pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, no drug to food interaction, minimum drug to drug interaction, no monitoring, no dosage, no require of blood testing, wide therapeutic range, no genetic polymorphism, and the onset is quick, the offset is quick. And it does not interfere with the quality of life patient can enjoy their life. Now, this is an overview of the achievements of NOACs over warfarin. You can see the stroke and systemic embolism is decreased by 19%. The major benefit is that the hemorrhagic stroke and intracranial hemorrhage are decreased roughly by 50%. And this indeed a great achievement. All cause mortality is decreased by 10%. And this is put again in a similar fashion. But the question before you is, suppose NOACs have come earlier than warfarin, what would have happened to warfarin? Now, when the warfarin is presented before a professional body for approval, what will we say? This warfarin increases the stroke or systemic embolism by 19%, significant. All cause mortality by 10%, ICH by 52%, major bleeds are increased by 31%, and it also only decreases GI bleed by 25%. I'm sure if uh, warfarin had come after NOACs, this drug would have never been approved. So NOAC certainly had a lot of advantages. And the biggest problem with uh, warfarin is that it's very difficult to have a stable INR in uh, warfarin therapy, particularly in the Asian. And if you look at the Indian figures, only 20% have therapeutic warfarin. Now, if we look at the overview of the trials of NOACs, in terms of stroke or systemic embolism, as you can see, Debigatron 150 and Apexaban are superior, the others are inferior. Now, if you look at the intracranial hemorrhage, all NOACs universally, in respect of the dose, are superior in decreasing intracranial hemorrhages, as you can see on the slide. And in terms of major bleeding, Debigatron 110, as you can see, is better. And Apexaban 2.505 is better. Uh, Debigatron 150 and Rivaroxaban are just like warfarin. If you look at the old course debt, Apexaban is available to us. Eudoxaban is not. Apexaban decreases old course mortality. Now, time and again, it is said warfarin is cheap, and that is one of the biggest advantages. But when we look at the reality, Warfarin therapy one month costs 450 rupees. You have to add the cost of the INR, which may be 300 or so. You have to add the visit of the expert or the consultant because they often have fluctuating INRs and you may require one or two INRs, sometimes even more. And the INR, there is no facility in the rural areas. Patient has come to an urban area to get the INR. So if you calculate the cost, particularly in today's context where Debigatron is now available at cheaper cost, uh, it is no longer cheap compared to. And the biggest problem with warfarin is if it produces intracranial bleed, the patient often oozes continuously and often dies. And you can see in the Asian context, all bleedings are more, whether it is a major bleeding, whether it's a gastrointestinal bleeding, as you can see on the left of the slide, or intracranial hemorrhage, or all major plus minor bleeding, Indians and the South Asians are more prone for bleeding and warfarin is notorious for intracranial bleed, and all these bleeds have a very high mortality. And newer agents, as we know, decreases ICH by roughly 50%. The other thing which is often projected is warfarin can be used safely in CKD because it is not <coughs> excreted into the kidney, it is metabolized by the liver. But now adverse data is coming up with warfarin. This is the data of the results of the Canadian control study which is shocking, two lakhs patient ESRD, 1,000 patient on hemodialysis for ESRD on warfarin, and warfarin showed worst of the both world. No reduction in the stroke and a 44% increase in major bleeding. So despite the fact that it is not metabolized by the kidney, you can see the adverse data, and uh, although guidelines still recommend uh, warfarin for CKD, but now exciting data is coming with the Paxaban. In 2014, US FDA approved it for using in patients with CKD, even in patients or 
hemodialysis. So there's a trend towards increased use of epixaban in CKD and in patients even on dialysis. But when you are using NOAX, you have to take this into consideration. What percentage of NOAX is excreted to the kidney? Dabigatron is right on the top, 80%. 33% of Roxaban and 27 or 25% of Epexaban. So Epexaban is safest in CKD. Only one fourth is excreted through the kidneys. And this is the HRA slide. You can see in CKD, if you are kidney clearance, so EGFR is above 50, Debigatron can be used. Roxaban, Adoxaban, Epexaban, all can be used without modification of the dose. But if the EGFR decreases below 50, Debigatron, you may have to decrease the dose to 110 milligrams twice daily. With Rebexaban, you can have to reduce the dose to 50 milligrams. You can use up to 15 uh, EGFR. And for Rebexaban, again, uh, you can use up to 30. And below that, you have to reduce the dose to 2.5 milligrams. Now, interesting data is emerging in the context of the advantages of uh, NOACs over uh, Warfarin on CKD, and you can see NOACs are associated with lower risk of adverse renal outcomes compared to Warfarin. Whether you look at the greater than 30% decline in GFR, as you can see on the left side of the slide, or doubling of C-recordin on the right side of the slide, or acute kidney injury or acute kidney failure, you can see the decline in renal function is less with NOACs, although Debigatron and Rebroxaban has shown to have better data compared with Apexaban. And this again shows that Debigatron is better than the VKAs. And Apexaban has not shown very exciting result in the context of declining EGFR. And even the guideline, as you can see, 2019 AHAACC uh, talks about this, that there's evidence of preservation of renal function with the Roxaban versus the uh, uh, Warfarin. Now, what about the other uh, advantage, which we used to talk in past that warfarin has an antidote VKA, but look at the reality. Even if you give intravenous vitamin K, it takes eight to 12 hours. And by the that time, most of the patient will be dead. So even in warfarin toxicity, never forget to use PCC because it acts immediately and lasts for 12 to 24 hours. If you use only intravenous, uh, uh, vitamin K in a, in a serious bleeding, life-threatening bleed, uh, more often the patient will die. But now we have very quick reversal agents for uh, NOAX, reversal agent for Ritarizucumab, for Debigatron is available in the Indian context, Adnexet, and uh, although approved by US FDA, but is not yet available, may be available in futures. And Ritarizucumab have shown very exciting result in the reverse ADA trial. There's complete and rapid reversal of the anticoagulant effect within a short time, is very well tolerated. There's no prothromb uh, prothrombotic effects, and there are several other advantages. Time does not permit to go to. The other advantage, which was often talked in past, that you can monitor warfarin by INR, and NOAC, there's a no specific test is available. But all of us know NOACs in usual clinical circumstances do not require monitoring. They have predictable uh, pharmacodynamics, aspects in special circumstances, they require monitoring, for example, if there's a life-threatening threatening bleed, severe renal dysfunction. But you can have a rough idea about uh, Debigatron by looking at APPT. If APPT at uh, trough is more than 80, uh, it is an indicator that it may be responsible for bleeding. If you want to have a very specific test, then we have the acarine clotting time or dilute thrombantine. Acarine clotting time is preferred. Rivaroxaban, Apexaban, NT10 ASA can be done, but these tests are usually not available except in research lab. Now, when we look at the food to food and drug interaction, look at this. Everything interacts with warfarin. Major drug interaction 208, moderate 395, minor 200. So, patients who are taking warfarin, they are in great trouble. What to eat, what not to eat, which medicine to take, which not to take, it's very difficult. There are interactions uh, with the NOACs also. You can see Debigatron only interacts with PDGP inhibitors like Verapamil. You have to be cautious when you are using Emeteron, Deronderon, which we use. Other drug, Quinidine, of course, not much use. And the effect can be decreased with PDGP inducers like uh, uh, Phenytoin, which may be a problem in embolic stroke, or uh, Carbazepine, or Rifampicin if the patient has uh, tuberculosis. 
whereas rivaroxaban apixaban also interacts with cyp3 cyp3 a4 that is you have to be careful if you are using antifungal agents and you have to be careful with uh, the protease inhibitors but uh, small number of drugs are interacting compared to warfarin now pci again all of us know after the augustus trial the dual combination of vkas with clopidogrel has been replaced by noax with clopidogrel and these two agents are the drug of choice after a brief triple therapy depending on the ischemic risk very interesting data has emerged on uh, noax in atherosclerosis you can see in the middle of the slide that doax are associated with significant uh, inhibition of atherosclerosis compared to wax and we all are aware of the two trials the atl acs and the compass although they are not uh, relevant in the present context topic of atrial fibrillation and the one of the biggest advantage of the noax is they are user friendly both for the patient and both for the physician the physicians are happy the patients are happy so if we look at the various uh, uh, points between vkas and dukas what we use therapeutic range wide therapeutic range with doax narrow with vkas onset and offset quick with doax good interaction no interaction drug interaction very few warfarin there are lots of drug interaction monitoring no monitoring required like uh, um, warfarin pharmacokinetics predictable stable anticoagulation yes no with uh, warfarin ich decreased by 50% genetic polymorphism no user friendly yes interference with quality of life no reversal agent rapid acting agent are available although they are costly use in ckd more and more people are uh, shifting to paxaban utility in pci in afib doax plus clopidogrel is preferred compared to vkas with clopidogrel inhibition of atherosclerosis again exciting data is emerging with uh, doax so if doax have come earlier than warfarin i'm sure warfarin would have never been approved i've already talked so what is the take home message time has come that doax are getting in and vkas are getting out vk era in non valve atrial fibrillation this non valve is becoming a history and time has come to say goodbye to vk is in non valve atrial fibrillation the only place left for vk is is tight mitral stenosis and prosthetic valves but there's lot of emerging data in these two subset also in future we may see infiltration of noax even in these two subset of patients what is the dicta of guidelines on the use of noax in non valve atrial fibrillation the heart rhythm society apscc long back 2017 has already done it it recommends noax as the default choice for prevention of stroke in atrial fibrillation the ac guidelines says when a patient of non valve atrial fibrillation is eligible both for a noax and vk vk noax should be preferred as a class 1a indication and we said the only place left at the present state of time is moderate to tight stenosis and mechanical prosthetic thank you very much for your kind attention thank you professor manoria for your very interesting talk and now i think the session also will be saying bye bye very soon yeah. uh, so open uh, for uh, comments uh, and suggestions of my, my co chairman and the audience thank you professor vanoria for the excellent audience are welcome for any comments and questions yeah i have a question to you how do you select amongst various noax that are available in the market narrative and preferences yeah yeah there are no head to head trials but based on the trials that are available we can select a particular noax now if your ischemic risk is high and bleeding risk is not high which means the has blood score is less than 3 debigatran 150 certainly the drug of choice because it is superior in terms of prevention of stroke on the other hand if your bleeding risk is high which means your has has blood score is more than 3 and the ischemic risk is not high the preferred agents are apixaban and rivaroxaban in patients with uh, ckd i have already told apixaban is a better drug you can also use rivaroxaban for secondary prophylaxis of stroke again you have better data with rivaroxaban if there is a gi bleed again apixaban is the drug of choice because it doesn't it decreases gi bleed unlike the other agents with increases blood work and if there is some gastrointestinal upset 
again, the drug of choice is apexaban and not rivaroxaban. And if the patient is non-compliant or elderly, again, rivaroxaban because it is once daily. And if the patient has atherosclerotic uh, CAD, again, uh, rivaroxaban would be the drug of choice. So this is how we select these agents, although there's no head-to-head -head trial with these agents, and I'm sure they will never be conducted in future. Is it necessary to take rivaroxaban with food? Because yes, if you don't yes. take with food, yes. the availability of the bioavailability is very less. And many of the physicians do not give these instructions to the patient that it should be taken with the food, whereas others need not. It so, increases absorption by roughly 40%. So that yeah. is uh, that should be there. Agreed. If you don't take with food, yeah. the availability is less than 60%. The other agent uh, does not matter, but rivaroxaban has to be recommended it can be to be report. taken with it. Yes, right. One more question I would like to ask Professor Manoria. When do you switch amongst NOAC and how do you do that? Now, suppose there are several circumstances we may have to switch amongst NOAC. Suppose a patient is on Debigatran and he develops CKD, maybe an acute kidney injury or otherwise, then you should not use Debigatran because 80% of Debigatran is excreted through the kidney. You have to switch over to Apexaban. The second patient is on Apexaban. He develops an ischemic stroke. Again, you have to switch to Debigatran 150 milligram BD. Patient on Debigatran develops GI bleed. Again, you have to switch on to Apexaban. So now whenever the question of switch comes, you have to remember what is the duration of the drug. If the drug in question is Apexaban, or Rivrox, if the Apexaban or Debigatran, usually their action uh, disappears within uh, 12 hours or a little more. But for Debigatran, you have to take the creatine clearance into consideration. The CKD, you have to wait for more time. Rivroxaban takes roughly 24 hours. So waiting after this period, you can switch on to the other agent. But this is required because of these reasons that there are several other reasons we may have to interchange amongst the NOACs. Yeah, any other questions, comments are welcome. So uh, I had one thing about uh, the use of uh, NOAC swallowing of PCI. And the European Society has recently in its AF guidelines brought out a very astonishing thing that <clears throat> NOAC plus two DAPT can be restricted only to one week if your PCI result is to your satisfaction. Uh, this was previously one month and three months, but now you can reduce the triple therapy to one week. And after one week, you can continue for one year the NOAC plus uh, clopidogrel. And at the end of one year in a AF patient who has undergone a PCI, you can only be on NOAC. So reduction to one week of triple therapy is something that is news from the ESC guidelines. I think all, you are right, all depends on the ischemic risk. If the ischemic risk is very high, you may even prolong more. Suppose you are doing a left main stenting okay. and, and there are others. So all descends on the ischemic risk, high ischemic risk, uh, the intervention cardiologist may like to continue for. But one week is, as you said, ESC guidelines. But you have to prolong the individual cases if the ischemic risk is high. Your patient has a lot of high ischemic risk. Certainly. What is your speculation for use of NOACs in future in tight metal stenosis? and mechanical prosthetic valve, which are contraindications at present? Now, this is a very interesting question. Now, at the present state of time, moderate tight stenosis and mechanical prosthetic valves are class three indication, means they are contraindicated. You should not use NOx in these. But now, a lot of interesting data is emerging in favor of NOx. We have observational data in favor of NOACs, which suggests that if you use NOACs, there is less uh, ischemic event, there's less bleeding risk. We have data from the meta-analysis, which shows less ischemic uh, risk and less bleeding risk. And uh, uh, the trials are also going, the one trial with the rivaroxaban is going in mitral stenosis and that with Debigatran uh, also undergoing so until we have a randomized controlled trial which shows beneficial effect, uh, these agents cannot be used. But a lot of work is in going and many people believe based on these observational studies and the meta-analysis which have shown favorable results in favor of NOACs, uh, in future, uh, they may become an indication. In the context of prosthetic valves, uh, 
the only one trial which was uh, presented was the real anion trial which showed increased ischemic events increased bleeding events it was prematurely terminated but the problem with this trial was number one the dose of dabigatran was used was that of atrial fibrillation whereas the prostatic valve scenario is entirely different in the post operative phase uh, absorption of the drug is less and the bioavailability of dabigatran is only 3 to 7% there is intense inflammation there is increase in the procoagulant uh, uh, factor tissue factor there is also increased platelet activation so what turns out from this trial is most of these events occurred in the first 3 months some of the events occurs in the 3 to 6 months so a trial is being planned and it is undergoing which will initiate these agents after 6 months so if the trial comes out to be positive you may see that we may be using noax after 6 months or so but dabigatran the question was raised you had selected an agent with the viability of 3 to 7% in a post operative trial it might not have been absorbed and you cannot uh, translate the dose of atrial fibrillation to uh, prostatic well where the scenario is entirely so so lot of work is in going and uh, the reality will come from the future trials what is interesting thank you exceptionally you might use uh, noax in the setting of aortic regurgitation might yeah aortic regurgitation might be prostatic valves well but that to exceptionally not as your first choice maybe but exceptionally the valvular uh, atrial fibrillation uh, means moderate to tight stenosis and the prostatic valves all others are non valvular and the river trial shows that even in the bioprostatic valves there are the a few questions from exciting. the audience yeah can we take a few questions yes, from sure. the audience uh, dr manoria yes yes yeah uh, dr virender agarwal wants to know why we cannot use noax in valvular atrial fibrillation as we said the scenario in valvular atrial fibrillation is entirely different the left atrial is damaged there's inflammation in the left atrium there are increase in the coagulability there's platelet activation because of blood in mitral stenosis uh, damages the left atrium so there are several in the prostatic valve the scenario is entirely different there's lot of intense inflammation there's increase in procoagulant factor and because warfarin is multifaceted action that produces better results but trials are ongoing people have a uh, recommended uh, randomized control trials even in mitral stenosis and the mitral stenosis trial has already been initiated you also want to know the different brand names for noax different brand names brand names for noax devi getran uh, pradexa was the first and now i think the devi clot and devi got so many things are available apexaven eliquis is available now generic apexaven is also available so all these agents are available in the market dr kiran Dr. Kiran Bai wants to know uh, what is your recommendation to use Novax in patient with GI ulcers. See, if the patient has an active ulcer, it should be treated first. It should not start a Novax all in a patient who is already history of GI bleed. And only when it has been treated, the preferred agent would be apexaven and not dabigatran or rivaroxaban, because they increase GI bleeding. If you are not able to use apexaven for some reason, dabigatran 110 would be the second choice. and the gentleman wants to know is there superiority of one noax over the other in different indications but that you already covered already said any other question comment welcome comments only comments thank you dr yeah. manoria it was a wonderful lecture you have updated us on all these aspects but for all the audience professor manoria is a man in hurry if he had it metformin would have been out and also mm -hmm. warfarin as he justified has also been out so bye bye to all these drugs before we say bye bye to each other thank you dr manoria it is, it is very painful to say bye bye to drugs which have been very close to our hearts aspirin warfarin metformin but the digoxin digoxin also some newer data is coming but the reality is there inevitable it changes the way of life we must change everything in this universe changes yeah it's all evidence based they are being phased out they are all evidence based so before we close this session i would like to add uh, one point i mean i would like to say something in honor of professor manoria who is a legendary cardiologist excellent orator and was a very popular teacher amongst the pg students he would leave no stone unturned to sharpen the bedside clinical skills of the resident doctors when i was doing my residency way back in 80s nice meeting us